Yeah, um, I'm going to um, talk about, introduce the Accord project. It's a bit of a mouthful, but we stand for Archaeology, Community, Co-Production of Research Data. So Accord for short. Um, and there's numerous people um, um, on the project. Um, I'm Barry, the research assistant on the project. Alex Hale is here too, from the Royal Commission. Um, we're me and Stuart Jeffrey, who's the PI on the project, um, are based at the digital sorry, the Digital Design Studio at the Glasgow School of Art. Um, our other partners other than RCAMS are, um, is Shan Jones at the University of Manchester and Karen Jones at Archaeology Scotland. Um, the Accord project explores the... Oh, uh, which one is, uh, keep the current colours? Yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> so the project it explores the opportunities and implications of digital visualization technologies for community engagement and research and our ethos <coughs> is very much about co-production and in partnership with communities together we create three-dimensional models of heritage sites and objects and um, these techniques we argue um, well have until now and um, currently remains firmly in the domain of experts and specialists um, and professional authorities often govern, govern the use of, of digital uh, visualisation technologies. And um, so as a result, expressions of community-based value and social value, ideas of belo belonging and ownership and identity, are rarely um, addressed. So I'm going to try and introduce um, uh, those issues in, in this paper. Um, well, I'll first also talk about barriers to digital and uh, co-production of uh, these digital records and visualizations. Um, oh, it keeps asking me. But um, as the session um, is titled OK Computer, I thought I'd just, I'd just think about that. I'm a big fan of Radiohead, so having Zan also done this Adams. But um, I think um, there's still this element of fear. Um, I'm talking about my experience working with communities with technology. And um, perhaps this is a kind of harking back to, to the idea of agency, the agency of the computer them being sort of a, a brain and this kind of machine. Um, but actually in this era of the Internet of Things um, and this kind of unparalleled access to digital technology, we all have, as you mentioned, smartphones or tablets and so on. Um, we have the ability to make more records and interpretations for heritage than ever before. But I want to pose the question of whether this perhaps dilutes um, authenticity. Um, but I will try and argue that in fact I think it restores authenticity. Um, <laughs> uh, so actually I want to shift the agency away from the computer back to the people. And I want to think about how we engage with technology in that way. Um, and so um, with apologies to Tim Ingold, I think it's uh, quite complicated, <laughs> but uh, it's, it's about um, the idea of a decentralised, which was just mentioned, the idea of a decentralised um, relationship with technology, and it's also about the intangible ideas of social value and belonging that these technologies can enable, um, and it's about all these networks of engagement around um, heritage and digital technology. So I renamed the paper, <laughs> um, so we call it Stories According to Communities, because I want to give the power back to people in the So, hope that's that. So, just quickly, uh, yeah, we're funded for 15 months through the Connected Communities and Digital Transformations Program, and as I've mentioned, the partners and, and the people involved. Bottom one. Bottom one. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm just this idea of um, authenticity. Um, I find, well, we find as a project, I think we've talked about this paper a lot by the Tor and Lowe, and they introduced this <coughs> idea of migration and migration of the aura. Um, Shan Jones, um, one of our uh, co eyes on the project, um, is a specialist <coughs> on social value um, and uh, working with communities, um, and. I think this is it's basically to highlight that um, while perhaps a monument is lo the location of our entanglement, the knot in an Ingoldian sense, 
is actually when all the intangible aspects are uh, collide with this monument um, in the making of a replica or a record, and if that be digital, so be, um, that then the aura can actually migrate from the original. So there's a complex engagement here. So the notion of authenticity sort of buzzes around the experience of the tangible heritage, the monument. And in Shan Jones' words, it's the contested meanings and identities which surround the monument which are crucial. So this idea of social value which we embed within our research as <coughs> part of the Accord project. And the monument is not seen merely as a living thing, but crucially as a living member of the community. So it's also a, a sort of community member. Um, replicas too. A, a good replica can therefore be authentic. So 3D models or 3D records can be authentic. Um, the previous slide you saw the discovery of the um, original, the, um, the early medieval uh, base of this cross slab from Hilton of Cadwell in um, North East Scotland. Here is um, at the same time as that discovery was made, they had already commissioned an artist to make a replica, to make a, um, a version of his own of that whole piece. Um, and, but he, they couldn't predict the finding of their basements. That was a kind of happy coincidence. But still, I think the people value this as an authentic object, and it's it's actually got more meaning than the original in some um, circumstances because it's situated within the landscape, and they were part of the. They saw Barry Grove carving it. They were part of that community of engagement, and um, therefore it's a living member of the community for them. It's the monument. Anyway, to, so professional priorities, the idea that professional priorities dominate, um, it's rare that a um, uh, kind of digital record will cross over into the popular domain. <coughs> and that would argue that the, the statue here in Waterloo, the kind of icon of Glasgow now, you might have seen it in the Commonwealth Games a lot, that's a rare example. Often the um, people don't know how to use these or don't have access to these models um, because they're hidden away and um, they're not made publicly available. People don't understand the copyright issues surrounding them as well. So whether they're permiss like it's permissible to use them in their research or work. And these are the types of traditional activities and audiences that, that uh, 3D digital visualization techn um, techniques have been used. And um, there's probably more to add to that list. But I hope Gabriel Moshenka here will, will forgive me uh, quoting him. <laughs> um, I think we need to subvert this relationship. Almost, I'm calling here for a little bit of an anarchy of, of archaeology. Um, uh, I'll just read this out. We must recognise that archaeology is currently in many respects written by specialists and performed to a public audience. So we must attempt to manipulate this discourse to counteract alienation and shallow passive consumption. And as has already been mentioned, I would buy in, I think the Accord project buys into this ethos that we are all archaeologists now. And this has been said by the kind of famous um, archaeological provocateur, um, Michael Shanks. So, the Accord research questions um, try to address the, the idea of co production and how this might change people's relationship to the site or object and if it does and instill people with a different sense of, of ownership and by taking this out of the academy in, in a sense. So what are the barriers? Um, and yeah, how, how this will how actually engaging with digital technologies will <coughs> transform. We believe that it will transform and regenerate different relationships um, with, with uh, heritage um, and generate uh, community-based social value. And to do this, we're using the technologies of RTI, that stands for Reflectance Transformation Imaging, photogrammetry um, and 3D printing. In the main, we have used LiDAR, but very occasionally because that's not um, as collaborative and not as um, accessible a technology to most people. <coughs> um, so in general, we try and use consumer level technologies. And we integrate 
the models we create with um, contextual content and statements of social value. And these will be archived in an open access online um, archive at the Ar Archaeology Data Service under a CC by license, so that's Creative Commons. So essentially, people can do with whatever they want with the results. Um, actually, it's pretty much unlimited as long as they reference the makers. So I've mentioned RTI. Um, yeah, it's a horrible word. I'm just going to try and introduce some of the barriers here. I, mean, I think language is really one of the main barriers, and um, the lingo used, and the kind of the, that's come up um, already as well. This is quite a frightening diagram. I don't think I even understand a lot of those acronyms. But in fact, in the field, um, it's actually pretty um, easy um, to do once you once you know how. And um, here's an example made by the Rhiney Women Group in Aberdeenshire. And they rediscovered this um, Pictish stone. It actually shows a Pictish man, probably, or it could be a woman, but a person holding a um, stick, perhaps with uh, rings on the other end. But that's been rediscovered through this process. They, they knew about the stone, it was in their churchyard, but they didn't, um, they, they, they had never seen it before, so that was quite interesting. But photogrammetry is another technique we use. Again, horrible diagrams, very abstracted. But in reality, again, in the field, um, anyone can do it. You can use many different devices, you can even do it on your iPhone, and you essentially dance around the the monument and you can create a fantastic 3D model. So this was made by the Arden American Community Archaeology Group in Argyllshire. Um, so I think it's about also <coughs> making the unfamiliar familiar. And it's about communicating technologies in ways that are accessible. So actually both these techniques are, are based in photography and to most people that's a fairly accessible way to explain it rather than um, thinking about the kind of sexy newness of digital technologies, which can actually instill a bit of fear and exclusivity, is about making it familiar and accessible. <coughs> um, it's an interesting point as well. We found that a lot of our groups want to um, turn this into a physical, take it back out of the virtual world into a physical thing again. So 3D printing here has been quite a powerful tool. Um, we've got an example of <coughs> pass around of the Dublin cross. Um, <laughs> so yeah, we're, we're often um, engaged with 3D printing too. So I'll just run through a few more examples and try and bring out the kind of idea of social value, if I have time. Just jumping about a bit, sorry. Um, <laughs> um, it's, it's, uh, this group really highlighted the issue of, of um, very, the very personal connection to heritage <coughs> has had real importance. So actually for this group up in Bressa in uh, Shetland, it wasn't the technologies that got that enticed them to get involved with the cord. It was actually the genealogy, this idea of making a record um, that they could experience in, in an enhanced and individualized way um, of a site where their family members grew up and it's now abandoned. So one of our site, um, one of the group participants, it was her father-in-law's father was the last person to live in this manse. And then he was literally the last person actually to be in that township. So this was the last house standing in the way. So immediately when we arrived as the <coughs> team, it was about the site and the heritage. And oh yeah, tangentially, it was about the kind of photogrammetic <coughs> modeling techniques. So it's about what drives the project as well. It's quite interesting. Um, and here's a photograph of that very man um, sitting in that manse with his wife. So Laurie Manson, and it was Jane Manson's relative. So these things are incredibly important and that's why it's about building a rich model. It's not just about the, the 3D model itself, it's about all that um, social value and that baggage attached to it. 
Um, another example is the Colin Tribe Blend Rural Development Trust, another mouthful here. But they actually cooperatively own a woodland um, and they were obsessed with making a model of the cairn. So again, it was the heritage that drive their engagement. It was the site of the cairn. And this is um, in a very prominent, visible location in their woodland. Um, there's also economic factors driving this engagement as well. They wanted to create something that would be enticing to a new public to encourage tourists to come visit their woodland. And to in a community at risk, they, they used that term themselves to describe their area and their community. They wanted to use tourism, heritage <coughs> tourism, as a way to kind of rejuvenate um, their economy. <coughs> so we, as the professionals, were like, well, I don't think laser scanning is going to work that well, not even photogrammetry, it's vegetation, it's too covered, it's just a mound, and um, it's a nice cairn, but you're not going to get a fantastic model. But nevertheless, we did it, um, because again, it was the heritage that was important. Um, I'm sorry I don't have the uh, result. We used laser, laser scanning. Um, I don't have an image of the result because Al's away in Japan and so on, <laughs> our colleague. But um, the result has now been passed on to the Forestry Commission um, by the group because they value it. It's not a great result, <laughs> like we thought, but they still value it as a document almost of importance, of value for their own um, purposes as a group in order to protect this site. Um, for, for tourism, so it, it does have power. And this is another um, uh, example of the same group, this is Cathy, um, who made this model of um, a cut marked slab in the woodland, and um, they've now redirected their path to go past this um, cut marked slab. Again, this was lost, so these technologies are really important for making the invisible visible, if you will. Um, they knew that the slab existed, but they didn't know where it was. We found a possible target and photogrammetry highlighted the cut marks on the slab, so we found it by using this technique. And now they have this model, so therefore they, they've literally, they're directing their visitors to this store. Um, hopefully this video will work. And um, these models also have a wow factor, and I don't think that can be underestimated. They are enticing and attractive. Um, but again, this highlights the issue of professional priorities, this, this particular um, model. Um, up in the US, um, this group recognized this um, Iron Age wheelhouse as an icon of their um, archaeology. And they were Again, it was about the heritage, not the techniques so, so much. Um, they were very intent on making a photogrammetic model of this wheelhouse. Um, the archaeologists in the area, and ourselves to be honest, were a little bit hesitant because this wheelhouse, this particular wheelhouse, had been excavated by an amateur and partially reconstructed. So its authenticity, if you will, was under question in a kind of archaeological sense. But nevertheless, the group thought it was um, a, a good example because you could see it, it was, it was recognisable, you could see it, the structure, you could recognise it as a house. Um, so we recorded it. So um, I guess I'm posing the question here, by making these records, are we then legitimising this monument as an authentic piece of heritage and, and kind of the, the power, the role of making these records um, for the group is interesting. But of course, these digital method, uh, digital records have the ability to be layered with multiple <coughs> interpretations, and, and so they're not um, necessarily uh, static models. And again, we printed it as we could. <laughs> um, so, just to conclude, um. I think by understanding and incorporating the different motivations into applications of digital technologies will ultimately make more relevant, useful and arguably authentic records. It's about all the kind of social value attached to them as well. And 3D models are flexible technologies. So we're very good for this aim. Um, and as I said, they will be made openly accessible. Um, 
An open definition of heritage will, will increase the sense of ownership and pride and enhance, um, add to our great places, it's <coughs> a place making activity. Um, do we agree that we are all archaeologists now? Um, are we? Can we be? Does this, is this the way forward, perhaps? Um, authenticity lies in creativity, I'd say. Um, and embracing these new technologies, I think I've also shown, just by doing in the field, actively getting engaged, <coughs> um, perhaps being driven by the heritage itself, um, we can break down the barriers to these technologies. But perhaps there's more we can do. Um, so ultimately as well, I hope this will also inform us as practitioners, professional archaeologists, um, and provide important, a new type of rich research resource. Um, yeah, great. Um, I think that's everything I wanted to say. I want to thank our uh, Archaeology of Scotland uh, for, for and Arcans and all our partners for the because um, uh, they're our sort of legacy with the community groups. So they've got the established. Our research is in essence a little bit quick and dirty over the summer, but. The relationships are ongoing. I also want to highlight that I've missed out a really exciting engagement with the Dumbarton rock climbers, which Alex Hill is talking about tomorrow in a different session. And that also talks about perhaps the non traditional types of heritage that we work with and, and non traditional groups, communities of interest, um, which we have been engaged with before as well. So, in the archaeology of sports session. Yeah, archaeology of yeah. sports session tomorrow morning. Thanks.